Welcome to the Michigan Concussion Center Quarterly Speaker Series. My name is Stephen Brolio. I'm the director of the Michigan Concussion Center. Uh, this session is being recorded today and will be posted on our website, concussion.umich.edu. Well, I'd like to introduce our speaker right now uh, and extend our sincerest gratitude to Dr. Willie Stewart for joining us today. Dr. Stewart is a consultant neuropathologist and honorary associate professor at the University of Glasgow and, and an adjunct associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Through multiple research programs, Dr. Stewart's lab leverages the unique resources of the Glasgow TBI archive to characterize the pathology of traumatic brain injury across all severities and survival time points. Dr. Stewart also leads the field study looking at lifelong health outcomes in former soccer players and is a co-lead of the Connect TBI, a Center Without Walls initiative, bringing together tissue archives and research expertise from multiple international institutions to characterize TBI-related neurodegenerative disease. Today, he will be speaking on chronic traumatic encephalopathy, major issue or minor trend. Please welcome Dr. Stewart, and we appreciate your time here today. Fantastic, uh, and uh, thanks, Steve, for the invitation to uh, come and join you. Um, I, uh, I think one of the things that, uh, see, I'm, I'm not very good at multitasking. One of the things that, uh, this uh, um, pandemic has done is it's 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 one of the many difficult to travel, but it's actually um, it's it's brought us together um, in ways like this. So so here am I sitting on an evening in uh, Glasgow where it, it's snowing and, and horrible outside, uh, and it's after nine at night. But but I can I can link up with with good friends in in America and uh, and share our story. So this is this is a great way to do it. Um, so um, let's just cut to the chase. I know we, we kind of had a technical problem, so we, we, we're kind of eating into time and, and I'd like to get to discussion as quick as possible. The, these are views of, of Glasgow in, in warmer days when, when people could get out and about more. So that's the university up on the hill and uh, our hospital, uh, which I, I keep calling the new hospital, but it's been there for eight years now. So it's no longer new, it's falling apart, uh, which is typical of modern builds. Uh, and I, I'm just going to do the, uh, the the thank yous and disclosures right at the beginning because uh, I, I tend to do them at the end and then we kind of miss the summary slides. So uh, thank you, obviously, to the people in Glasgow and Penn that have done all the hard work and, and allows me to do the, the speaking and to the, the people who fund me. I do um, do some uh, consultancy work for uh, sports associations, uh, but none of this is paid and uh, uh, I'm uh, really just there to in give independent advice. So... CTE, um, outcomes, dementia from sport. This is a, this is a big issue. Um, obviously, it's been a big issue for a decade or more in the US, but it, it's becoming an increasing issue uh, globally. Um, some of you may keep in touch with what happens in the Southern Hemisphere, but we're, we're seeing stories from Australia in the last uh, few months on discovery of CTE there and concussion problems in sport there. But also, uh, we in the, in the UK and Europe have been uh, dealing with, with similar problems for uh, probably at the same time as, as have been in the US, but perhaps not to quite the, the same extent. Although in the last few years, uh, things have really started to pick up. And, and this is just headlines from the last couple of months. Uh, this is the tail end of last year where they're looking at soccer. Just just uh, watch. I, 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 I'm not in the US so often, so I'm, I'm kind of getting out of the habit of saying soccer. So I may say football. When I say football, unless I preface it with American, I'm, I'm talking about proper football. Um, so that's soccer ball. But here they're looking at, at uh, whether dementia in soccer should be an industrial disease. So the players uh, have been damaged by the game and should be entitled to compensation. Um, World Cup winning uh, footballer Nobby Styles passed away um, just the tail end of last year and uh, was found to have CTE and, and family are calling for change. And most recently, um, towards the end of last year, Rugby World Cup, this is rugby now, uh, Rugby World Cup winner from uh, the early 2000s, Steve Thompson, um, has uh, uh, told the story of his dementia and, and a litigation has been launched there in a similar fashion to the litigation that was, that was launched against American football. So you can see similarities in what's been happening uh, in, uh, in your side of the world as well. And one of the things that's come up in this litigation um, are statements like, uh, the solicitor acting on behalf of them saying that potentially up to 50%, 50% of all rugby union players playing in the professional era, and that's from mid-90s onwards, uh, will end up with a neurological complication. Just, just think of that, 50%. Imagine you're uh, a professional uh, rugby player playing or, or has played in the last 20 years and, and you read this in the, in the papers. What, what are you going to think? And of course, this is, this is similar to the kind of uh, reporting we see 
uh, in US media. This is obviously a famous now New York Times article off the back of, of uh, uh, a JAMA um, paper looking at uh, CTE in, in uh, the Boston series of American footballers saying that 110 of 111 of the NFL brains that were studied had uh, evidence of CTE. And of course, this creates real concern. You know, what does this mean? 110, 99% have CTE. So this must be a, a huge problem. And so we end up with this, this, this narrative, this, this uh, perception at the moment, um, particularly from player side, but, but from public side as well, that, that CTE is almost inevitable. Um, participate in certain sports, you will develop degenerative brain disease, and it will be this CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Also, that, that, that really, you know, the only thing to worry about in sport is CTE in terms of neurodegeneration, that, that uh, other degenerative pathologies, other degenerative diseases aren't really discussed in the same way. Um, and actually, this is, this is a, a, a feedback to family because I deal with families and, and we may give them diagnoses that aren't CTE. And, and, and sometimes, you know, you almost get a sense of disappointment in the family that, that they, uh, we were expecting the game to have done the damage to them. And, and why is it not CTE? And I'll, I'll discuss more of that later. Another part of the story is that mental health issues are inevitably involved. So uh, uh, suicide um, is, is associated with CTE or degenerative brain injury in sport. And that uh, this whole issue is just a, an issue of sport. Um, you know, this is something that is uh, uniquely linked in some way to sport or certainly CTE is, um, and we wouldn't expect to see it outside of sport, uh, military, you know, but, but, uh, but in that context, um, you know, if you get hit by a car, you don't get CTE. That's the, the kind of narrative that we're seeing at the moment. So let's try and pick these apart one by one. CTE, um, as you know, is, is a term that became uh, um, really popular, um, really into the, the public uh, uh, perception uh, in the mid 2000, 2005, when, when Bennett Amalu and, and the well-told story uh, of uh, Mike Webster described uh, amyloid tau pathology seen up in that uh, top left-hand corner and neurofibrillary tangles of, sorry, amyloid plaque pathology and neurofibrillary tangles of tau. Uh, and and he, he felt this pattern looked like uh, something he, he'd come across, something he'd read in the books that boxers had, this, this pathology of dementia pugilistica. Um, but Mike Webster hadn't been a, a boxer. He'd been an American footballer who um, had, had hit on hard times and had uh, significant neurological problems. And so he didn't feel that, that dementia pugilistica was appropriate, but going back through the literature, and there was this mention of, of chronic traumatic encephalopathy as an interchangeable term with dementia pugilistica. And so he felt rather than calling it a pugilist disease, a boxer's disease, that, then stick to more generic chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. And that story, as you know, is, or is told in Concussion, the movie, or, or a version of that story, perhaps not the, the, uh, the straight uh, uh, narrative without any embellishments. But of course, as I say, CTE, as, as we now recognize it, is, is not by any means a new disease. It's just newly recognized outside of boxing because we'd known about it for boxing really since the beginning of, of last century, since the uh, late 1920s, uh, when the first clinical description putting together the concept of, of, of uh, boxers with, with neurological disease uh, was described by Harrison Martlett. And it took several decades, really, for the pathology to begin to emerge. There were, there were isolated cases in various journals um, describing uh, boxers' pathology, but it wasn't really until Caselis's famous series in the early 70s that enough cases were put together and the story was, was, was kind of put together of exactly what the kind of uh, the damage, what the uh, the expectation might be, looking down a microscope, and there was a couple of structural changes, septum pellucidum changes in particular mentioned, um, some scarring of the tonsils, but down a microscope, um, the thing that stood out in the initial series was these neurofibrillary tangles, and later with a re-examination, the presence of amyloid plaque. So that really formed what uh, for, for many, many years as a pathologist, we would, we would um, if we were given a brain of a boxer and told that he had, he had issues, this is the kind of thing we'd be looking for. But we only really looked for it in boxers because that was where this disease was. We didn't recognize it anywhere else. It was just a boxer's disease, dementia pugilistica. And if you go to the textbooks in pathology, there's a, a line uh, when it talks about degenerative brain disease that mentions that you know boxers can get this dementia pugilistica and often reference back to the pathologist described uh, by Carcellus and, and one or two series afterwards. But that's not really enough. We, we, once we 
begin to recognize this is a disease that's not just in boxes, it's not a rare disease perhaps, but perhaps a more common disease, then as pathologists, we, we want to um, give ourselves the tools uh, that we can use to actually you know, go out into our archives and, and look at cases where uh, we may not necessarily expect to see it, like American football, like rugby, like football, and, and, and try to, to get better at recognizing, better at defining the presence of the disease. So to do that as pathologists, what we do is we, we hold a consensus meeting um, where uh, those of us who are interested or have some experience get together, having reviewed uh, a number of cases uh, of the pathology in question, and we uh, debate and discuss and sometimes uh, get involved in heated um, arguments about what we think is the most important feature. Um, and at the end of that process, which uh, for this consensus, uh, the review of the cases went on months in advance and the discussion took uh, several days in Boston. By the end of that process, uh, we have something that goes beyond that, you know, a few lines or paragraph in a pathology textbook to, to, to a formal definition. This is what we as experts believe uh, CTE should look like down a microscope. And the important thing in this was that we really focused just on tau. Um, and what we said was that we were looking for abnormal tau deposited in neurons and astrocytes uh, in a patchy distribution at the depths of sulci. So these are different cases, um, all stained for hyperphosphorylated tau. And you can see that at the depths, the folds of the brain, there are these brown uh, smudgy blobs, which are the uh, tau deposits. And that, that's the kind of low power, you know, instant, I think this is CTE. And when you get closer in and look at it, then what we see is that often these are clustered around blood vessels. There's a blood vessel there, blood vessel there. And as I say, there's this mixture of neurons and astrocytes. So that became the definition of CTE. So having that definition, we, we start to look at our cases coming through centers and begin to you know, build up a picture of what exactly this uh, might mean. And this is a series from, from our, our Glasgow experience uh, published a year or two ago, um, looking at football and rugby. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's the structural change we're seeing. There's a septum pellucidum with, with holes of fenestration in it. There's the, the tau deposited around uh, vessels at the depths of a sulcus. So CTE, neuropathologic change. Now, I'm introducing a term here that you don't hear very often. You hear CTE all the time. You hear talk of CTE. You talk of CTE in brains. Talk of CTE in diagnoses. But but I'm I'm introducing a new term here: CTE neuropathologic change. The importance being that that as a pathologist, what I see is pathology. I don't see disease. I see pathology. So all I can say is this brain has these brains have the pathology of CTE. CTE neuropathologic change. Just as we've always done for many years, looked down a microscope and said this brain has Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic changes. So the distinction being some people can have Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic changes, but be relatively cognitively intact. So the pathology doesn't necessarily define the disease, but it certainly is important to record it. So CTE neuropathologic change we see in high numbers of our former footballers and rugbyers, just as it's seen in American football. But look, the other thing is we see a lot of other pathology, Alzheimer's disease changes, amyloid angiopathy, TDP43, which is a frontotemporal dementia pathology, uh, vascular pathologies, Lewy body pathologies, a whole bunch of things going on. It's not just CTE in these cases. And when we sit and do careful case reviews with the family and go back through the case notes, and review the imaging and the investigations and everything we can get our hands on and come up with a, an opinion, an integrated clinical pathological diagnosis of what we think the diagnosis is. So taking the pathology with all the history together, look, many of these cases have CTE, but actually, not so many of them have CTE as a diagnosis of dementia. Okay, let's take this case here. High CTE change, but also a lot of vascular pathology. And you speak to the, the family, it, it's a typical vascular presentation with stepwise progression and, and these kind of you know, uh, gradual decline over time with a, with, a, with, a, with a systemic vascular disease as well. So that's an important point. And if we look at, this is just a selection, but if we look at the series in Glasgow now and just look at all the cases we've had in the last four or five years and percentages, what we see is that in football and rugby, you know, averaged out, it's about 75%, about three quarters of the cases we look at have CTE neuropathology, CTE neuropathologic change in the brain, but less than half of our patients with dementia actually have CTE as a diagnosis. Okay, that's really important. That's something that often is missed because this means that 
actually in, in, in sports, men and women, you know, athletes with uh, dementia, it, it's not just CT. We're not just looking for CT. We're also thinking about what other diagnoses might they have. The CT is important, tells us there's been exposure to brain injury, but the other pathologies are just as important because, you know, a rugby player with Alzheimer's disease could just as easily perhaps be a consequence of uh, the, the game. And really what we're getting at here is that, that in our experience and, and looking through the literature, when you actually consider the pathologies in people who've been exposed to brain injury, um, it's not just this tire pathology. It's not just CTE pathology. It's not just restricted to one protein, one abnormality. The brains of people who've been, who've been exposed to brain injury in sport and are also you know, hit by a car, one moderate or severe brain injury, are quite remarkably full of pathology. Yes, tau is there, tau is frequent, and that may be the indicator of brain injury. But also we see blood-brain barriers broken down, amyloid pathologies as plaque and angiopathy, inflammation, you know, and the list goes on. So years after being exposed to brain injury, there's a whole constellation of pathologies in these patients. Uh, that's not just one single protein. And I think there's a danger that, that in, in focusing, fixating, worrying about one protein, worrying about CT, worrying about the type pathology, we, 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 we're maybe missing the bigger picture. You know, this isn't just, you know, let's just say that we're, we're looking at the trunk here. This isn't just a, you know, an elephant's like a big snake. We're actually, if we just focus on the tau, we're, we're missing the amyloid. We're missing the, the uh, inflammation. We're missing the vascular change. We may be missing the reason that this person has disease in the first place, um, because the tau may just be a, a sign of previous injury, but not necessarily the disease process. Which brings us to our current thinking and this TBI-related neurodegeneration. Essentially, you know, we're seeing in people who are exposed to repetitive brain injury and also to single, moderate and severe brain injury. So this isn't exclusive to just sport. This is also something you can see when you're hit by a car and you end up with a few days in ITU with a moderate or severe brain injury. That, that there's a variety of pathologies. Yes, tau is important, no doubt about it, but also the inflammation, the external change, all these other pathologies are present in these brains too. And so now we're getting towards this concept of TBI-related neurodegeneration or trend. Uh, and essentially that, that, that means that we're thinking about these different proteinopathies, for instance, that are uh, associated with brain injury that can be exacerbated by brain injury, that can be more prevalent in people with brain injury, that can be more severe in people with brain injury. And it, it's somehow a mixture of these plus other pathologies that may not have listed there, may not recognize that end up producing a clinical syndrome. And that clinical syndrome can be one of a number of things depending on the weight of pathology and the way the patient presents. And with that syndrome in some patients, less than half is CTE. So that, that's why we're, you know we, we, the title of the talk is CTE, a major problem or a minor trend. Well, well I think it's one of many TBI related neurodegenerations. And that's incredibly important. We need to get beyond the idea of just one single protein, one single problem. Now, uh, just let me kind of um, come back to this pathology. So there we have uh, early consensus, first round, definitive. That's CTE. Yeah. Go off, find CTE. Nothing more you need to know about that. Well, that's not quite the case. When we look at CT, I'm just going to do a quick bunch of, of pathology things, which for those of you who are not, not interested in pathology or used to pathology, um, just stick with me. It's only two slides, and then we'll be back into the, the mainstream. But but this is our characterization of the tau. We're trying to figure out, because tau is not a, a protein unique to CTE. You see it in Alzheimer's disease. You see it in a bunch of other diseases. So, so is there something different about this tau? The short story in this characterization of tau down a light microscope using different ways of staining it, different antibodies to, to mark it up is that actually the tau we see in the astrocytes as much as you see in aging pathology. The tau we see in the neurons in CTE as much as you see in Alzheimer's disease and aging. So in other words, the tau that we see in CTE doesn't appear to be any different to that that we'd see in aging and Alzheimer's disease. What about its distribution? Well, we said that it's important to have neurons and astrocytes. Well, here's a, here's a study we had published uh, quite recently looking at the distribution of neurons and astrocytes in uh, CTE. And remember, we talked about this clustering, this, this patchy pathology at the depths of sulcus. Well, long story short, and here is if you, if you, you know, count all the neurons, count all the astrocytes, uh, or should I say, get somebody who's, who's exceptionally keen and, and, um, and thorough to count all the neurons and count all the astrocytes and come back with the data, what you find out is that it's the astrocyte that are the giveaway pathology. It's the astrocytes that are clustering at the depths of sulcus. It's the astrocytes uh, that are concentrated at that, that location, not the tangles. So, so perhaps 
perhaps, rather than thinking of CTE as a mixed neuronal and glial pathology, maybe we should start thinking about CTE as an astrocytic pathology. And that's important because it, it opens up a different inquiry, a different line of understanding for the disease. So to summarize the pathology can put part of this because that's, that's my thing. Um, but I'm going to go on to talk about other stuff, um, which might be more your thing. I don't know. But to summarize the uh, pathology side, um, we're thinking less about CTE being the only outcome in brain injury, about being the problem, uh, and more about trend TBI-related neurodegeneration, mix of pathologies. Yes, CTE is awfully important because I think that's the, the giveaway for brain injury being important in this case. So that's the giveaway for trauma. Um, but actually, it's not the only problem. Yes, it's present in majority, but, but often it's a comorbidity. So it's a, it's a pathology that's there in the background, but it's not the disease driving pathology. But, and importantly, get this, you know, if you take one message away, get this, take this away. CT, not unique to repetitive myo TBI, hit by a car, survive. Years later, look at your brain. We can see CTE there. It's not the only neuropathological outcome. I can't repeat this over and over and over again, but I'll, I will keep doing it over and over again. It's not the only neuropathology. And, and, and let's be clear, Although we, we, we talk confidently about what CTE is because we don't want to frighten you all, the reality is we've still got a way to go before we're fully characterizing CTE and understanding exactly what the pathology is. Okay, and this may be something that's been around for almost a century. This may be a pathology we've recognized for over 50 years, but, but we're only just beginning to um, roll our sleeves up and get sorted out here. Now, really important, and as a pathologist, I could get shot by the club by telling you this, but all these things, TBI-related neurogenition, CTE, they're just pathologies. They're not diagnoses. Okay. All I can see is a pathology. I can't tell you necessarily what the diagnosis is. We need to know the story to make that diagnosis. So that then brings us to, you know, what exactly is happening in former athletes? Um, you know, what, what, what's, what's the evidence that there's a problem there? Are we just seeing a funny pathology, but actually there's no real problem in the brain in terms of, of more dementia or, or, or different types of dementia? So we had a go at this with international rugby players. Um, this is Scottish international rugby players, some of whom were involved in our study. Um, and we pulled these guys in, pulled in some of their neighbors and friends who weren't rugby players and put them through a bunch of, of uh, tests to, to test brain function. And the short story in this is that we did a whole bunch of sophisticated things for brain function and found out that when you did that, there were minimal, tiny, tiny differences between rugby players and the guys next door. And the differences were in some memory recall and in fine motor control um, and, and in the dominant hand. And, and, and neither of these were clinically suspicious. Neither of these actually would the players have known about. Neither of these would, would you know, doctors in the clinic have picked up on. You know, the, the players weren't even saying, look, I'm, I'm trying to get you know, nuts out of a bowl in the bar and I, I can't quite you know, grab them with my dominant hand the way I used to, you know, fine motor control. They, nothing that they would notice. So in other words, Doing this inquiry of their brains, we found nothing in particular. But what we did find, though, importantly, was that the cardiovascular disease was an awful lot better than, than the, the, the guys next door. So brains didn't seem to be too bad in these middle-aged, 50s on average, uh, former rugby players, but their hearts seemed better off. But we wondered if we were going about it the wrong way. Maybe, maybe looking in middle age isn't, isn't the place to look at at this point. Maybe what we should do is be looking at, at later in life, looking at, at, at when dementia sets in and, and problems start to rise. Now, go back to Mike Webster, 2002, uh, diagnosed uh, with CTE or, or passed away and diagnosed with CTE. Uh, and there was a study, as, as you, you're probably quite familiar with, um, some years ago that looked at uh, causes of death in uh, American football and found that when you looked at causes of death in American football compared to American males, then the causes of death from degenerative brain diseases in American footballers was considerably higher than you might expect. So we wondered whether this might be a way to attack our soccer players. Let's look at, at not how brains of rugby players, brains of soccer players are working in midlife, but let's think about the bigger picture. What's happening? Is there any evidence there's more dementia? Now, coincidentally, you know, this problem in soccer should have been known about for about the same time because at the same time as Mike Webster died in 2002, Jeff Astle died in 2002 as well. And a coroner in his inquest in 2002 said that uh, after a pathologist colleague of mine had looked at his brain, that his brain was damaged by heading a football and that his dementia was caused by heading a football. And yet from 2002 to five or six years ago, nothing was really, no attention was paid to this at all in soccer. Compare that to 2002 with Mike Webster and suddenly we're getting more information in American football. So we set out to try and, you know, 
perform a similar study to the American football study, but perhaps improve on it if we could, if that's possible. And this is this field study. Um, to give it its full title, now, remember, we'd, we'd learned from a rugby study that, that, that actually the problems in, that we were looking for in athletes wasn't just brain problems. We were seeing better health in other places. So, we, so you know, better cardiovascular disease could have an impact on degenerative brain disease, could have an impact on dementia risk. So, so actually, we set about to look at lifelong health. So this, this acronym um, came to me on a cycle ride, as all the best acronyms do. And it's football's influence on lifelong health uh, and dementia risk. Um, you know, for, for, for you, obviously that's soccer, but it doesn't really work so well. Sealed doesn't look quite as good as field. So anyway, the, the whole point in this was to look at whether our footballers had uh, higher dementia rates than expected, but also what was their uh, physical and mental health like? So yeah, okay, let's look at dementia, but let's look at the rest of their outcomes as well. What else is, is, is football doing to the lifelong health? Um, just to explain how we did it, as I say, the American football study looked at um, the uh, American national statistics. Um, what we wanted to do was look a bit closer at, at, at people that were more like our footballers. So, so in our Scottish Health Service, we've got a system where every geographic postcode area um, has a deprivation index attached to it, and that's based on income, housing, education, crime, all these things that, that um, uh, signify deprivation. Uh, and so it's possible to, for instance, take take me and match me with people in the population who um, have different characteristics. So, you know, um, I, I ride bikes. So let's look for people who don't ride bikes, who are in the, the same uh, demographic uh, area as me, a deprivation uh, index as me, and compare our health outcomes. So we did that with our footballers. We had an archive of every Scottish footballer um, uh, from the last century right up to 1976, so born in 1976. So they would be uh, 40 odd years by now. Uh, and just under 10,000 of them, of which just under 8,000 of them, we managed to identify their electronic health records. Uh, and then what we did was we matched them um, to three people in the neighborhood who were as near as close to them as we could, born in the same year, same sex, you know, same deprivation index. And we matched the health outcomes. And so we ended up you know, do, looking at this study at 8,000 football, footballers matched to uh, just over 23,000 of our uh, local Scottish population controls. And summarizing that, what we found, we looked at mortality, looked at primary cause of death. So what did they actually, the doctors say they died of? And when we look at that, we find our footballers' mortality was slightly lower. So, so you know, the, 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 it's a good news story, slightly lower mortality. Um, that's up to about age 70, then, then the mortality flipped and, and uh, uh, deaths in our footballers were slightly higher. But in terms of breaking it down to common causes of death, um, the standout was that they had about eight, our footballers had about 80% cardiovascular deaths than the population control. Good news, heart, again, telling us the heart's better. That the lung cancer deaths were about half um, because we think these guys were smoking less, and that's obviously a major risk factor. It's about half the lung cancer deaths. But look, neurodegenerative disease, fourfold higher death from neurodegenerative disease than we saw in our population controls. Now, I've, I've already said that our footballers' mortality was slightly better off than uh, our, our controls, and, and the biggest risk factor for dementia is getting old. So perhaps maybe all we're seeing is that uh, our footballers are getting older, therefore they're developing more degenerative brain disease. So we adjusted for the competing risks of heart disease, lung cancer, or cancers. Uh, and the adjusted figure, so, so balancing for living longer, if you like, comes out at three and a half. So actually, the underlying problem in football is a three and a half fold increased risk of degenerative brain disease uh, than we'd expect. Now, that neurodegenerative brain disease covers a whole bunch of, of things. It's not just one diagnosis, dementias, motor neuron disease, Parkinson's disease, and so on. So what happens if we break it down and look at those one by one. So, so now instead of looking at what the direct cause of death is, we're looking at the, the direct cause of death and also what we call the secondary cause of death. So somebody can die of a heart attack, but they also have Alzheimer's disease and that, that Alzheimer's disease is recorded on the death certificate. That gives us a slightly different perspective, gives us the kind of rate of, of, uh, of reporting. And when we do that, we find that the actual instance of disease, the, the, sorry, the, the rate, the risk of disease um, varies by diagnosis lowest Parkinson's disease. But look, Parkinson's disease is, is, is twice as, as, as high uh, in our footballers as we'd expect. Uh, motor neuron disease, four times higher than we'd expect. Alzheimer's disease, five times higher than we'd expect. So, so what we're seeing is a picture that, that actually, it's not just one diagnosis, 
dementia that might be confused with CTE. Importantly, CTE is not coded, so there's no way of getting at that number. But it, but it may be mistaken um, for Alzheimer's disease or similar dementias. So so perhaps you know in here would be our CTEs. Now if 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 it were just CTE, just dementia, we'd expect just to see the Alzheimer's dementias and and you know mixed dementias coming up as a risk. But actually, we were seeing also motor neuron disease, also Parkinson's disease. Far harder to confuse these with CTE. So so we're seeing not just one diagnosis. We're seeing a number of diagnoses. And remember what we're saying about pathology. When I start the pathology. We're seeing mixed pathologies, a number of different pathologies. So, so the clinical and the pathology seem to match up. Clinical experience and pathology experience at this level of data seem to match up. Mixed pathology, mixed diagnoses. Put this side by side, soccer um, against American football, slightly different methodologies. We looked at match controls and the, the, uh, the Lehman study looked at, at you know, the uh, US population data. But, but look, you know, surprisingly, these numbers are very, very similar. Look at that, dementia, not otherwise specified, virtually the same. Motor neuron disease, virtually the same. Parkinson's, not, not, not too different. You know, the numbers are very low in the, in the NFL study, so, so the, hence the, the wide confidence intervals. But look, the story is similar though, isn't it? You know, so I don't know what you, how you feel about this, but American football always strikes me as a physically aggressive, brutal um, sport. Soccer, less so. But perhaps... The fewer games, less time in a pitch, um, in a season, perhaps shorter careers, compared to you know the numerous soccer games that are in a season, um, training you know uh, every day a week, heading hundreds of times, literally hundreds of times a week. I mean, in, in a career of a, a footballer, you could be talking about thousands upon thousands of head impacts uh, cumulatively, and then there's the the injuries when when players compete. So so maybe this cumulative dose here. The cumulative dose here are not so far apart, and that's why we're seeing some of the pictures. Just to go with the dose, this this isn't really for repeating at the moment because it's not quite published, is that uh, when we break it down by sports, this is a different data set looking at a slightly different way of, of calculating the data, but when we break it down by position and look at uh, risk of uh, neurodegenerative disease, again, in all our players, again, the, the, the figure's much the same, about three and a half, four. Uh, but look, goalkeepers, uh, slightly higher than, than we'd see in the population controls and actually just doesn't quite you know make it away from the the the, the line one so so statistically not different I mean slightly higher but statistically not different in controls so goalkeepers don't seem to be so badly affected outfield however fourfold higher defenders you know that's not a position you want to play in because that looks like the highest risk play up front risk is lower so we're beginning to see that this looks like it's an outfield issue not a goalkeeper issue. And when you look at the difference between outfield and goalkeeper, one standout is obviously head injury impact or head impacts and head injury exposure. The, the outfield positions are about threefold higher risk of head injury than goalkeepers. And then you add into that the um, uh, the head impacts from heading. So when you come back to this, you know, common uh, perceptions, common misperceptions, CTE is by no means an inevitable consequence of participation in sport. Yes, your risk of dementia is higher. Your risk of degenerative brain disease in soccer and NFL is higher. You know, about three and a half, four times higher. But it's not the only pathology and not the only outcome which is necessarily linked to this. You know, we're seeing our footballers with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, motor neuron disease, similar, fig similar experience in, in American football. When you look down the microscope, the pathology looks that mixed. Mental health issues. Let me just touch on that. Again, we see reports uh, of uh, people tragically taking their life and when they look down a microscope, they find CTE and the CTE is then unequivocally linked to uh, the, uh, the, the reason that they took their life. But the reality is when you actually look at, this, look, at, look at the reporting of this, look at the, the, the data on this, look at the studies on this in pathology. And what you find is that actually um, suicide rates, many of the mental health outcomes are lower in CTE positive cases than they are in CTE negative cases. So in other words, it looks like people with CTE, you know, contrary to what we might believe, appear to have fewer mental health issues than people without CTE. Now that's a really worrying, worrying misunderstanding that people seem to have. But, but remember, we're talking about pathology. What about actually clinically and outcomes? So here's, we're back to our, our footballers, our soccer players, our field study. 
And you know, I've already said, this is a, slight, a, a group we know have high neurogenitive disease, three and a half times higher neurogenitive disease. So if, if there's a mental health issue that goes along with this neurogenitive disease, we'd expect to see in the same population, high levels of mental health issues. So we looked at common mental health disorders and, and some of them that are, that are commonly associated or said to be associated with CTE. And what we do when we find that is actually our footballers are doing far better than our population controls. Half, or sometimes less than half, risk of mental health outcome, mental health disorder than our population controls. In the suicide data, um, we saw our footballers had slightly fewer suicides, but actually the numbers of suicides, thankfully, were so low um, that actually we couldn't statistically make anything from that, but, but slightly lower, certainly no higher. <coughs> Excuse me. So picture here is that we know footballers have high risk of neurogenitive disease. We know there's a variety of different diagnoses. We know down the microscope, they've got 75% of them have uh, CTE and just under half of them have a diagnosis of CTE. And yet, when you look at mental health outcomes, they're better. So let's look at where we currently stand at identifying CTE in life. Um, the problem is we, we can't do it terribly accurately. You know, we don't really have a good clinical criteria for identifying CTE at the moment. It still relies on peering down a microscope and it still relies on good clinical pathological correlation. This is the current proposed criteria for, for traumatic encephalopathy syndrome, which is the, um, the, correlate, the clinical correlate, if you like, proposed for CTE. And I think the important thing here is that, that th th this, this all sounds fantastic, but look at a list of, of potential symptoms. There's about 50 odd potential symptoms that crop up in CTE. I, I, to be honest, a disease with that many proposed symptoms, I begin to wonder how many of them are, are necessarily uh, specific. But let's just take what I've discussed so far and apply them to the current criteria for traumatic, traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. First of all, history of multiple head impacts. It's not necessary. Exclude it if there's a moderate or severe impact. Not necessary. Uh, again, exclude if there's single TBI. Not necessary. We, we see CTE in people who've had one exposure to brain injury. Okay, We don't need multiple head impacts to see CTE or more precisely trauma, uh, TBI related neurodegeneration. Um, behavioral symptoms. Um, you know, there's a variety of different papers looked at applying some of these behavioral symptoms to American male population uh, survey data sets. Uh, and the, the short one of that is that essentially a lot of these symptoms are not uncommon in middle aged uh, men in America and, and elsewhere in the world. I've already said suicidality um, is not necessarily linked to it. You know, if anything, there's fewer suicides in CT positive cases. Headache is so vague that we, we shouldn't really bother with that. Um, so effectively, when you, you trim out all these uh, criteria for traumatic encephalopathy syndrome and, and, and look at the actual evidence and data and, and apply this to these criteria, you end up with something which is a history of head impacts, uh, no other neurological disorder, progressive disease, you know, cognitive decline. So, so we're not much further forward in terms of understanding than and we were back at the beginning uh, with punch drunk syndrome. And that's not quite true. We've made a lot of advances, but, but, but I don't think we're really anywhere near defining the clinical syndrome. So coming back to this, common misperceptions. CTE, again, not necessarily an inevitable consequence of participation in sport. Risk is higher, but, but not inevitably um, going to develop disease. It's not the only new generation. Mental health issues, including side aid and so Susan, are not as far as I'm concerned, proven features and the data don't seem to support that. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm, there's plenty of time to gather more data, but, but right as we stand at the moment, I'm not so convinced of this. And that's a really worrying thing to tie people into believing. Uh, and neurogenation in, and neurodegeneration in TBI um, is a unique sport problem. Well, we, well that's not true. I mean, we, we, we see this um, in plenty of other places. Um, at CTE, we see, for instance, in people who hit by a car. And indeed, don't just take my word for it. This is the Lancet Commission from the end of last year, which looked at all the evidence for uh, modifiable risk factors for dementia uh, and added a couple more to the list that were there already. And there's now about a dozen of these and included amongst these is traumatic brain injury, which they calculate uh, based on the available evidence is, is, is uh, responsible for about 3% of dementia in the community. So traumatic brain injury, and that's not sport. That's not sports related. That's just traumatic brain injury as a whole, responsible for about 3%. Now, I've, I've seen other you know, uh, figures from other places that would slightly higher figures than that, but, but let's just accept, we now know traumatic brain injury, risk for dementia, not restricted to sport, not by any means restricted to CTE. 
So what do we think is happening? Now, this is a, this is a, I've kind of modified this curve from, from the paper, but, but if you want to read more about it, it's in there. I, I, I kind of got this simplistic view of things, but it, but it works for the moment, um, is that, that what we're really talking about is, is the accumulation of pathology. Now, I'm not saying tau, I'm not saying amyloid, I'm not saying TDP, I'm not saying inflammation, I'm not saying vascular, I'm just saying pathology, because don't, I don't think we really know what the pathology is that, that, that drives us towards dementia. Um, but let's just say, you know, it could be something like tau. And, and, and what we know is the biggest risk factor for developing dementia is, is getting older. So at some point, as we age, as we get older, we cross a threshold where we've got clinical symptoms. You know, this could be Alzheimer's disease, could be CTE, could be Parkinson's disease, depending on what, what pathology is and how it accumulates. Throw into that a bang in the head. Hang on, my animation's got a bit ahead of me. So to, to think about this, um, I'm now, we're now beginning to think of, of our brain, our brain life, our life in three phases. An early phase when we're young, carefree, nothing's much can go wrong. We're, we, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're immune to everything and our brains are just ticking along nicely. Uh, midlife phase when the disease is actually beginning to set in and actually the pathology, the problems are beginning to emerge. You know, if we take people in middle age and they die and we chop up the brains, we do find tau, we do find amyloid, we do find evidence that, 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 that brains are beginning to, to disintegrate, degenerate. And then a late life phase, and that's the phase when the symptoms of this degeneration have begun to emerge. The dementia has set in, okay? Early, mid, late life. If we think about uh, somebody who gets uh, hit by a car, single, moderate, or severe, what we think is happening is that you develop an acute pathology. We can look down a microscope, hours, days after somebody's hit by a car, see a lot of amyloid in the brain, um, and that seems to disintegrate and degenerate and go away. But, but I don't think it ever quite gets back to normal. I think, I think in a proportion of people, the brain never quite recovers. And if anything, that, that this, of, this of acceleration towards uh, old age has set in. So, so the brain, if you like, is aging quicker. Uh, and they're going to cross that threshold at a slightly different point to where we might have expected it. Sport, lots of small injuries, head impacts, concussions, whatever, accumulatively, hundreds, thousands. Uh, doing a similar thing, each one of them producing small amounts of damage, which is recoverable in some way, but eventually, accumulatively, uh, what you do is you end up with something which doesn't really recover so well and, and puts you on this accelerated course. And so what we end up with in people who uh, are uh, exposed to, to, to injury is that, 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 that we've kind of shifted the, 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 the life phases. Early phase exposure, midlife with the accelerating developing disease, but not yet symptomatic and late life uh, disease uh, where um, problems are setting in. And, and that's something I tried to kind of put into um, 800 words. It's always a good way to formulate your thoughts, either give a talk or put it into 800 words. So, so this is last week in the British Medical uh, Journal trying to figure out what's going on. Early life, participating in sport, exposed to injury, midlife, no longer in the sport, spared from injury, but the brain is beginning to perhaps show signs of change. Late life, uh, when symptoms begin to emerge. Now, Thinking of it that way, early, middle, late life gives a completely different view on how we might approach research and management because there's something we can do to try and prevent this. Early life, get in early life, get in with current players, get with people who are participating in sport, get with people who are still engaged in the game and, and prevent, just, just you know, do something about brain impacts, do something about brain injuries, better manage brain injuries, better recognize them, reduce the impacts. We're, we're doing something with sport at the moment, football, trying desperately to get them to cut back on unnecessary head impacts during the week. Rugby, trying desperately to get them to cut back on unnecessary head impacts during the week. Late life, oh dear. Um, we just don't have anything. You know, dementia research management has, has gone on for decades and there's nothing we can do up to this point which makes a difference. So unfortunately, by this point, there's just nothing we can do other than, than count the, the count the numbers and try and understand what's happening with the disease and try try desperately to figure out ways of slowing progression or, or managing this disease. But 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 unfortunately, there's nothing we can do here. But but in the in the middle bit, we've kind of forgotten about this a bit, you know. So we, we're doing a lot of talking about um, people in the the early phase do something to try and prevent this. We talk about the the, the dangers of this. We we're doing. A lot of work to to improve the care, improve the the support for people in late life with disease, and and, and trying to understand what's happening in the brain. But but I think we're kind of forgetting this bit in the middle. And the problem is that bit in the middle. So the young players who are currently playing the game are you know immune, you know, going to live forever, don't need to worry about anything in the future. And that's kind of what we get feedback from them. Unfortunately, the old players who've developed disease, you know, it's it's too late to do anything for them. 
the bit in the middle are the ones who are reading the stories at the moment and hearing that they're going to be fifty uh, percent of them are going to develop degenerative brain disease and that their heroes and peers have, have already been diagnosed with dementia, uh, and hearing stories about you know potentially mental health associated with it. So 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 there's a big worry. This bit in the middle could be on progressing towards disease, but we're doing not very much to care and support them, and, and we're kind of if you like leaving them to the the mercies of of uh, of Google and Wikipedia and uh, and chat down the pub um, and not really getting in to help them. So we've just taken on. Uh, an idea which which is brain hope. Another another one out my bike came up with that one. Uh, brain health outcomes in professional and elite athletes, former professional elite athletes, and this is really a three pronged initiative which we're just launching in the next few weeks, strictly between us at the moment. Um, but we're launching this in the next few weeks, which is where we're going to immerse um, the three classic prongs of of what we do. So we're 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 going to you know obviously continue with research, and that's. The field study, we're trying to get a football and rugby study inside this Prevent Dementia, which is a, a study looking at midlife normal aging. So try and pick up the earliest indices of disease and do something about it. So, so we're, we're going to try and put in a cohort of football and rugby players alongside 700 population controls who have already been uh, recruited. Um, education, where we're going to reach out to players and former players associations through websites, seminars, etc., uh, and provide them with with you know, balanced, secure education as to what the the, the, the current um, state of play is and support. This is a really key thing. So again, we're working with associations and charities to try and reach the players to, to give them the education, give them the support, give them the helplines, give them the, the information they need, but also launching brain health clinics. And the idea in these is you capture people in the 40s and 50s, you sit down with them, you talk about risks for dementia. In these guys' cases, these women's cases, brain injury, already happened, nothing we can do about it, can't repair the brain, brain's, brain's already had that. But what about the blood pressure? What about the diet? What about the exercise? And it's surprising, you know, even these, these former athletes, how much we can do with them. So we're going to start these clinics off. The idea to give them hope, hence the brain hope. But each of these, of course, is inter, uh, intertwined because whatever we're learning in research is going to change our support and change our education and, and sitting, talking to players in seminars, directs our research and so on. So that's, that's where we are right at this moment. Literally yesterday, I dropped a, a grant in to um, get some of this research uh, sorted out, but we've already got pilot funding to get it going. So there's a big text-heavy slide um, to uh, summarize everything I think I've discussed. Uh, bang on the 45 minutes, uh, which is what I was given to talk. And so you can all read. And I'll let you read that if you like uh, and take questions if you've got any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Willie. That was uh, that was amazing. Uh, it was a masterclass in, in uh, CTE and, and the other work that you're doing. Thank you. Steve. Um, so we have uh, a number, as you can imagine, we have a number of questions already lined up. So um, I'll do my best to to get through them all. My guess is we're going to go over time a little bit, if that's okay with your schedule. No, well, I, I'm literally straight after this. I'm going to bed, so um, I've got nothing booked for the rest of the evening. Can okay. I? Well, we'll try not to keep you up too late then. So. <laughs> Um, the first one was actually submitted um, prior to the session today. I think it's a great question, though. Uh, it is, do you think that CTE propagates um, so much to other talpopathies, or at least as we're starting to see in the literature? Yeah, so I, 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 I you know, there's only so much we can squeeze in. Um, but uh, I, I did some work with uh, Elisa Zania from uh, Milan uh, a few years ago where um, she she had she had um, uh, done some work with a, a mouse model of brain injury, and it's it's a more severe brain, model of brain injury, where um, the um, shortly after brain injury and in, in the, the the hemisphere which was injured, you can detect um, tau positive profiles. Um, let the animal survive twelve months and go back and look at the brains, and you see the tau is now no longer just in the the ipsilateral hemisphere, but it's it's also in the contralateral hemisphere. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily say it spreads. That just says that, that, that the pathology is developed somewhere else. So the next phase in that was to um, uh, take a homogenate of the, the mouse brain. So, so basically just take the, the tau protein and inject it into uh, brains of, of naive mice who, who'd had a brain injury and see what happens. And, and lo and behold, uh, if you um, did that, you see that uh, on the around about the site, you inject it a few months later, tau is developing. Uh, leave it for several months more and you see it remote from the site and in the contralateral hemisphere. Now that, and there's also some, some other data from, from other models, 
would suggest that a bit like we see uh, tau propagation in a prion-like fashion in, uh, for instance, uh, Alzheimer's disease models, that then similar things may be happening in CTE. Um, so the tau may well be able to propagate. Um, and that may be why we see this original, original nidus if you get see people who are young in the, say, sort of frontal lobe, you know, depths of a sulcus, but, but, you know, come back to people in their 70s and 80s with uh, widespread disease and it's, it's throughout the brain. So it may be there's a, there's a spreading phenomenon there. Great, thank you. Uh, next one is related uh, really to, to how big of an issue this is. Um, the question is, what is the percent of professional athletes who demonstrate CTE dementia? And you sort of touched on that a bit, but maybe you can go in a little bit more. Um, or do we actually know? And then what about non-professional athletes? These are two great questions. Um, to get to get uh, uh, to get at the percent of athletes who have CTE uh, dementia or pathology, really requires a study where um, we need to see brain after brain after brain after brain after brain. We need to see you know not just you know dozens or hundreds of brains. We need to see thousands of brains to get a picture of what's going on in a population sense. And we just haven't done that. You know, all we can say is that uh, across the lifetime. Uh, the risk of degenerative brain disease is three and a half times higher in soccer players. Okay, so we looked at soccer players 40 to, you know, uh, the oldest you can imagine. Uh, and what we're saying is that across the lifetime, the risk is three and a half times higher. So if you take uh, a 40 year old, say the risk of, of uh, degenerative brain disease is, is fantastically small. I think it's 0.001%, something like that. It's, it's fantastically small. What we're saying is the risk in our soccer players in their 40s is about three and a half times higher than that. Now that's still a fantastically small number, but it, but it's but it's three and a half times more than we'd want, um, you know. But but if you go to the older years, seventies, eighties, then you're talking about you know five, ten percent people may have dementia. So we're talking three and a half times higher. So so it's an age dependent phenomenon, uh, and it's 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 it you know it, it's it's down that way. Now in terms of of amateurs, incredibly important. Um, the study we did looking at, at professional football could only be done in professional football at the moment because that's where the data set is of players. That, that, we need that. We need, we need to, a really comprehensive idea of every footballer who's played. Um, now we know, though, the scale of the problem. It's three and a half times higher. We, we've got an idea of what we're doing. Now we can go off um, to look at, at trying to find data sets of amateur players, data sets of players from other sports, um, and we don't need to now look for 8,000 because we know, this, we, we know that we can power our studies better. You know, we were just looking for as many as we could get. Now we can power the studies better. So we may be able to, you know, with, you know, a thousand, couple of thousand rugby players begin to, to, to drag some data together. What I would say in rugby, which is, the, you know, our local um, uh, sport equivalent to American football, is that the CTE cases I've seen in rugby have all been from the amateur era. So, so there is CTE in amateur rugby. I just don't know proportion how big a problem that is so yeah all right appreciate it uh the next one's a, a little bit of a two-part question um how do you account for the selection bias sample selection biased samples when making claims about cte for overall sports and then the the second part of that is what proportion or perhaps an estimate of brains donated from individuals or families of, an, of someone believed to have cte turn up without cte pathology uh, great questions. I mean, th this is why, you know, I, I'm really cautious that, that what we're doing is describing pathology. Um, you know, if, if, I, if I'd stuck to my guns on pathology, then we would never have done, looked at the population study. But I know the limitations of pathology. So we get donated brains from people who, um, you know, they, they, either they feel they've got a problem and so sign up um, long before or the families know there's a problem and want to, to know more. So they're, 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 they're keen to find out what's happening. So uh, you know, it's un undoubtedly a biased sample. So, so we've got to be careful in interpreting that in any way other than, than within our donation samples, within our, 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 our cases that have been given to us with dementia. You know, we, we haven't yet seen cases without dementia in our local series. Uh, then uh, that's a biased sample. But, but that's why we go to the epidemiological studies. That's why we go to the population data to get a picture of actually what's happening in the community rather than just what's happening in my mortuary. Um, so, so, you know, I, th I think that's the kind of level we need to be going to. We need to be thinking more about, about big data and less about single cases down the microscope. Sure. Great. Have you, next question, have you, have you in any of your data or maybe other data you're aware of, um, looked at the length of, uh, of the, the, our, our uh, audience members being international football and referencing soccer here, not American football. Uh, have you looked at the length of the career in relation to risk of neurodegenerative disease? Yep. 
Um, and again, I'm amongst friends, so I'll tell you, um, because it's, it's unpublished data. Um, and, it, and the longer you play professional football, the greater your risk of, of developing neurogenitive disease. Um, now, that, you, we take that with the, you know, it, it, people say, you know, is there enough data to worry about head injuries, head impacts in football? Uh, because there's just our one study. Um, and I, I never quite understand which study it is they're picking on at that point, because there are several studies. But, but we, we take this and say, okay, look, you know, we, I showed you the, the player position is important, outfield players. Um, the longer you play, the greater your risk. Um, when we look down a microscope, we see a pathology which is uniquely linked to brain injury. Think of it when we, we see it, 75% of our brains in dementia have CTE pathology. So, so for every brain without CTE pathology, we see three with CTE pathology. We see about three times more dementia than we should do. So, so the, the, you know, this, this all seems to be coming together as something to do with, with CTE, dementia, head injury. Um, so so I, think, I think, you know, we, um, we, we, we kind of have to say that the, there's a problem there with the head injury, head impact uh, and work on that. Great, thanks. Uh, what, and from your opinion, what might cause astrocyte telepathy resulting from trauma? Oh, that's a brilliant question. That is a brilliant, do you want to come and work for me? Because uh, <laughs> that is such a good question. Uh, and, and we're working on that. We're, we're desperate trying to pick that apart. Um, so, you know, you got to think about what the astrocytes are there and what they're doing. They're, they're, they're really important. I mean, astrocytes, I, 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 I give a bunch of talks to different people. And for years and years and years, I've been more fascinated by astrocytes than neurons, to be honest. Neurons are just kind of on or off or on or off, but astrocytes are doing so many more things. Um, I, I'm just confabulating because I've got, I've got no idea, but I've got a few, you know, is it an inflammatory response? Is it a vascular response? You know, who knows? I think that, you know, we've got to try and unpick the astrocytes, figure out what's going on there. Great, great question. Come and work for me. <laughs> I'll connect you uh, behind the scenes. We'll see. Yeah, do that. <laughs> Um, okay, um, given the role of mixed pathologies and CTE trend, how might risk factors for other dementias, such as genetic, lifestyle, familial, et cetera, play a role in the severity of the pathologies? Could underlying risk for other dementias make one more likely to also develop CTE trend? Or is the severity of CTE trend pathology thought to be purely related to exposure uh, to head impacts? Uh, so the, 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 sort of the, the unifying risk factor we see in, in the, the cases with CT, the cases with, with kind of head injury associated problems is, is the head injury. So that's, that's the unifying risk factor. So, you know, what, what, what's, what's the similarity between a soccer player and an American footballer? Well, there isn't really one, um, you know, there isn't, there isn't an obvious one, uh, you know, rugby and, and American football perhaps, but, but, you know, when you, when you look across the sports, the unifying risk factor is exposure to head injury, hit by a car, head injury. So, so we know that's the important risk factor, but that, that's why we're getting this midlife brain health problem because, because let's accept it's, it's, it's head injury. We, we, we can't do anything about it. When you're a 40 year old retired soccer player, 40 year old retired NFL player, there's nothing we can do about your brain injury. You've had that, you know, you've, you've stored that damage up. That's your, that, that's, that's, that's your risk factor strike one. But what about all these other ones? You know, um, I said there's, there's 11 other modifiable risk factors in there that we could be working with that we know of at the moment, never mind the ones we don't know. Of. So, so hence the Brain Health Clinic, sit down with the players now and say, this is what we know now is good for your brain health in the future. Well, what are you doing about blood pressure? What are you doing, as I said, kind of acid, et cetera. So let's work on that. Now, the research that we're doing in parallel is going to actually go much deeper than, than just what we know at the moment. So we're going to start thinking about the genetics, thinking about um, you know, the, the, the career exposure met metrics we might be able to gather from them. Think about you know, um, uh, the unknowns. You know, so so um, you know, we're, we're doing a bunch of kind of proteomics and all the rest of it. The things, things that you know, some of us are fishing exercise, but, but a lot of it is targeting what we think we know because that's the, the brain hope cycle. You know, if in our research, we start to pick up that these, this is a population who've got a particular problem with a particular risk factor, identified or unidentified, that's something else we can throw into the mix as early as possible in their career lifespan to try and modify risk. Does that make sense? So, so we're not giving up. We're not saying we know, but we do know some answers for general population. We can work on those. Great, perfect. Um, we're getting a little bit over here, so maybe one or two more, and uh, I can I see you. the clock behind you. I can see your time, so. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, what is the empirical evidence that CTE pathology is uniquely related to brain injury, both sport and non-sport? There's a small but growing number of studies that show CTE pathology in individuals with no known neurotrauma history. 
Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I, I think I think when, when we say small, let, let, let's let's put it in context that there, there there's very small number of studies uh, with often very small numbers of cases they've looked at. Um, in the the larger series, larger studies looking at, at you know brain bank donation archives um, with patients with dementia, patients without dementia. Um, that the the reality is that, that when you actually critically view them for CTE pathology, so defined as the consensus defines it, that, that virtually all of those cases have got a history of brain injury. Um, and the ones who don't are in so small numbers, you begin to wonder if, if there's something that hasn't been recorded in the story. So, um, you know, somebody who, who, who you know, may have played, you know, um, football at a level, but it's never been recorded, never been documented anywhere. You know, we, we've got clinics at the moment of, of, of patients with dementia who, their football stories has never been documented, um, and yet they're, they're there. So, so I, th I think, to be honest, I, I, you know, I've, I've seen study after study after study, and we've done our own study looking at the pen archive uh, for CTE pathology in the pen dementia archive. And every, I can tell you, I think every case where we've come across it has been a footballer or been exposed to brain injury somewhere else. So we haven't we haven't yet been able to find one. So I think I think whichever way we shake this down, if if not. 100%, 99%, 95%, but the overwhelming majority of people with CTE do have a story of brain injury. Great. So I have uh, two, two questions, uh, very similar here, so I'll kind of bundle them. Um, are you concerned that the modern narrative of CTE that includes significant mood and behavior issues yeah. has influenced current and retired athlete beliefs, despite the fact that it appears current evidence doesn't show they are characteristic of CTE? Have you considered how to measure uh, such beliefs and how they might influence the presence. Really, of really worried about that. Uh, really worried about that. Um, and uh, and that, that's one of the drivers to get this brain hope, you know, clinical support service up and running is that we, we give people the information that, that, that informs them what's going on, but also bring them into clinical service. Because I, th I think, I think a lot of, of um, the, the, the sort of, you know, 40, 50 year olds, you know, men, women, you know, it's it, midlife, particularly now, you know, God, you know, in the last year or so, you know, mental health issues are really not uncommon. But if, if you are developing a, a not uncommon problem with, you know, the common mental health disorder, if you're developing that problem, and at the same time, picking up a newspaper that tells you that you play rugby, you've got a 50% chance of genital brain disease, which is irreversible, progressive and relentless. You, you're going to put two and two together and come up with five and end up, you know, talking yourself into a cycle of, 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 of decline. So we want to capture these people because, because this is something, as you know, we can do something about, we can, we can work with mental health disorder. We can work with people and try and um, resolve that in some way. The other thing we're doing is uh, we're, we're, we're going to, as part of our study, you know, we've got um, a st study, which is just getting off the ground at the moment, which is actually to survey our, our former athletes and look at their, uh, current fears and perceptions around health and brain health and see if we can figure out exactly how this is this is affecting them um, and how what we can do to better target management so I, i'm really really worried about um the the, the sort of the, the the mental health side of it um that we we may be kind of you know over over presenting that and and, and maybe getting into trouble all right well um thank you this was this was phenomenal um we are we are out of time or over time for that matter but i, I want to thank you again for sharing all your knowledge with us um incredibly informative session um thank you to our viewers um, for your time today i apologize again for a little delay at the start um and sorry i'm seeing 15 or 16 additional questions that we just don't have time to get to but um really appreciate you dialing in Please be sure to check us out um, on the web at concussion.umesh.edu or on Twitter at UMesh Concussion. Willie, I think you're on Twitter. Yep. Twitter handle? Uh, Will Stu Neuro. All right. Um, we'll, so today was recorded and we'll be posting it on our website in uh, the next day or two. And please join us on April 29th from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern for our next speaker, Dr. Carolyn Emery from the University of Calgary. She'll be speaking about injury prevention in child and adolescent sport and recreation. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Much appreciated. Wonderful session. Take care, everybody. Thanks, so much. Thanks for the invite and to contribute. Enjoyed it. Take care.